All right, uh, end of our journey, at least for uh, for this one week for this topic. We still have uh, still have quite a few other journeys still before us, but um, we're getting we're getting very close to the end of I think certainly one of the two most challenging um, topics in our class. Um, and it's this idea of collinearity, sometimes referred to as multicollinearity. Um, I think in some ways, like this online approach gives you kind of a nice advantage because you might imagine like all of this is typically condensed into a four hour class. So, right, particularly for those of you that have like a night class, often you're like getting to this point, you've already heard three to three and a half hours of lecture. It's nine o'clock at night. And then your brain, your poor tired brain is trying to like grasp this last little topic which again is kind of tricky. So this last idea about collinearity, subtle, um, to really grasp it, it requires like a pretty strong grasp of math that's quite a bit above like the, the prerequisite for enrolling in our program. So it's one of those sections where we have to do a decent amount of hand waving, um, which I think is always tougher to do, right? We can always, pick up ideas better when we can kind of see how they're developed from the ground up. Um, and unfortunately, collinear is just one of those things that we can't really do. Um, to really kind of dig into its nuts and bolts um, requires like a pretty strong grasp of linear algebra. Some of you have probably taken a class in linear algebra, um, but I know quite a few of you haven't. So, um, you know, I, I can't really dive too deep into those things. So again, kind of like the transformations, you're gonna have to do a little bit of hand waving kind of focus on some kind of big picture takeaways. Um, that said, make sure you reinforce this by reading the textbook, um, you know, and maybe doing some kind of Googling and searching and so forth. Um, there's lots of additional resources online. And of course, you're always encouraged to uh, send me an email anytime you have any types of questions. All right, uh, buckle up because away we go. So, so what is this idea of collinearity? Collinearity um, exists when there is a strong linear relationship between the independent variables. That is when the x variables are functions of one another. Why do we care about collinearity? Well, in the presence of collinearity, that is in the presence of a strong, strong relationship or relationships amongst the x variables, um, we might be able to, to, we might be unable to get unique parameter estimates. This is called an over parameterization problem. Um, the variance of the regression terms can get very large. Um, because of that, we could get unstable estimates. What do I mean by unstable estimates? I mean that very, very small changes in our data, that is sort of tweaking the numbers by like just 2% or maybe even less than 2%, can lead to very large changes in regression coefficients. That is, a very small change in the data can change our regression coefficients by 20% or more. So it's kind of this idea of like instability. We could also get kind of weird situations where we get um, like a significant overall F test, which tells us to dig deeper, but then we dig deeper and like none of our partial F tests are significant, like strange kind of situations like that. So collinearity can be, can be a real thorn in our side. And because of that, we want to be able to detect whether or not it exists in our data. So something to kind of think about, um, consider the model um, y equals uh, beta naught plus beta one x one plus beta two, and that's not a typo, x one. So um, this is basically kind of the idea, and, I, and this is an extreme case but sometimes, right, sometimes comprehension happens in the extremities. What happens if we put the same variable in our model twice? 
Well, realistically, that's what? Realistically, that's just that second expression, isn't it? That is, we can factor out the x1. It's really just one variable. So, right, SAS would would realistically, if we, if we just put the variable in once as we should, then we can get like a coefficient. Maybe that coefficient is like 40. That's unique. But if we go back to that first equation where x1 is put in twice, we can see what I said in that previous slide about non-unique estimates, right? Because I can make those parameter estimates be a bunch of different things, right? So if, 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 the, if the beta 1 plus beta 2 is 40, there's a lot of different ways I can break that up between beta 1 and beta 2, right? I can make beta 1 uh, 1 and beta 2 39. I can make beta 110 and beta 230. I can make beta 120 and beta 220. That is that 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 first that first equation is sort of non-uniquely estimated. We refer to that as overparameterized. There's too many betas. We don't need we don't need two of them. And I know you might say, well, that's crazy. I would never do something like that. But a lot of you have, right? Think back to that lab. We were looking at like um, SAT performance at schools. You did something very similar, right? Where you tried to predict like total SAT scores based on the SAT verbal and the SAT math. And you were getting a lot of weird things in your output. You were getting like, uh, like B's and like degrees of freedom of either zero or infinity and like all kinds of weird stuff, right? It was a similar type situation. Well, whoops, you did something silly. And also, this same kind of idea is true if you put numbers that aren't exactly the same, but like are kind of functions of one another. So, right, maybe we put temperature, maybe, X, maybe we put temperature in terms of Celsius and temperature in terms of Fahrenheit because we didn't take the time to properly acquaint ourselves with the data set. That's going to lead to this problem. And again, I, I it, it stresses, it reinforces why those initial steps of getting acquainted with your data set are important. So we're not just blindly throwing variables into a model and creating a situation like this. Presumably, we get acquainted with our data set. We'd say, okay, this is Celsius, this is Fahrenheit. I know I don't need them both. But again, you might imagine working with a, a more technical data set with Right here they come again, those subterranean triglycerides. And maybe like the actual units and things being measured are so technical that you as a statistician don't even realize that two of these variables with these kind of crazy scientific names are in fact the same. So I know it's a simple situation. It's mostly done pedagogically to just show you in the extremity why this is a problem and where this non-uniqueness comes from. But I mean, we could certainly imagine situations where if we're not careful, we actually might do something like this. And so we're seeing why we need to be careful not to do that. Now, more generally, this problem is true anytime that one predictor is a linear combination of other predictors, right? So now the idea is, if I had, right, these are technically three different variables. If I put total SAT, SAT math, and SAT verbal, if I put those three variables into my model, that's going to create the same problem as before. Why? Because SAT total is a perfect linear combination of SAT verbal and SAT math. So now we're getting into situations where maybe it is a little easier to create that problem. Again, if we're not careful. Well, what if they're not perfect linear combinations, but they're heavily related to one another, right? So here we're talking about where like the situation where like right, we, we, we have x1 and x1. So that's like a perfect linear combination, like a perfect correlation. What if they have a high, but not perfect correlation? Their correlation is not one minus one, but close to one or minus one. Well, so consider these two variables, x1, x2. Maybe if we're talking about bears, right, we've seen that there's a pretty strong correlation between, say, 
like the length of a bear and the girth of a bear. So maybe like think of it like that. We can show mathematically that the estimators and more importantly the variance of the estimators for both beta 1 and beta 2 are proportional to that quantity right there. 1 over 1 minus, that's just correlation, the correlation between variable 1 and variable 2, that correlation squared. This quantity is referred to as a variance inflation factor. Variance inflation factor is often abbreviated uh, VIF. So, um, if we look at that quantity, what do we see? We see that that, that, that that variance inflation factor, it blows up, right? As that correlation gets closer and closer and closer to 1 or minus 1, as the square of the correlation gets closer to 1, that variance inflation factor is getting arbitrarily large, right? It's, 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 it's blowing up without bound. And that means its variance of the estimators is blowing up without bound. The variance is being inflated by how much? By that factor. And when that factor becomes quite large, it creates that instability that we talked about in the earlier slides. Yeah, so as we said, it's not too hard to see. You can go back to the slide if you need to. That is that correlation tends to one or minus one, the inflation factor goes to infinity, yeah, and that leads to the instability. I just said that already. So that's like with an x1 and an x2. How do I generalize that to k x's? This is something to meditate. I, I know from classroom lecture that this is something that um, can sometimes be a little bit tough for students to, uh, to digest. Although again, usually this is like the fourth hour of lecture. So their brains are probably fairly exhausted, right? By, by running like the, the mental equivalent of a half marathon at that point. Um, but we still have the same kind of idea of a variance inflation factor with k of these predictors, with k explanatory variables, with kx's. To find the variance inflation factor for, for say, um, for any one particular variable x, what do we do? We just, we just fit a regression model where that x is a function of all the other x's and we look at the r squared of that regression model. Does that make sense? So again, we want to know whether one is like a linear combination of all the others. So like if I wanted to know the variance inflation factor for, for, for variable one, imagine that I have like five variables and I want the variance inflation factor for the, for the first variable, how would I get that? I would just, I, I, would, I would fit a model where x1 is on the left and x2, x3, x4, and x5 are on the right. It's a regression model, so it has an r-squared. All regression models have r-squared. We talked about r-squared all the time. If that r-squared is large, it means that our model, x2, x3, x4, x5, explain a large percent of x1. That means x1 is a, is a linear combination or close to linear combination of the others, and that's going to create problems, right? So the variance inflation factor, again, can blow up, can get large, if any one of those x's is a close to perfect linear combination of the others. What do I mean by close to perfect? I mean if I fit a regression model, it has a large r-squared. So here are some rules of thumb. So we say when that variance inflation factor is large, that's a problem. Well, how large is large? A usual rule of thumb is 10. Anytime we see a variance inflation factor greater than 10, then we say, okay, that's a problem. We should do something about it. And if you go back to the formula, I'll let you kind of do that on your own. You can kind of reverse transform that. A VIF of 10 corresponds to an R squared or correlation squared of 0.9 or higher. And a correlation of 
um, relates to a roughly a correlation with that has an absolute value of 0.95 or higher. So when the variables are highly correlated, what do I mean by highly correlated? 0.95 or higher, I expect to see a variance inflation factor that's 10 or higher. I can get these variance inflation factors from SAS pretty easily. Um, in PROC REG, in my model statement, I could just do slash VIF. So I see in a little snippet of the output, right, there's like my usual parameter estimates. So that's stuff that I'm used to seeing. But if I look way over to the right, I can see the variance inflation factors for each of my variables. So I can see chest is 8.9, length is 5.3, neck is uh, 7.5, age is 2.2. So the variance inflation factor is a little bit large on chest, um, but not above and beyond the usually accepted kind of danger threshold of 10. So, so far, everything looks good. So there's our conclusion. None of, the none of the variables have a VIF, a variance inflation factor, more than 10. So collinearity does not appear to be an issue. This part's all pretty straightforward, right? That is, there's not <coughs> <coughs> nothing too crazy going on here. <coughs> well, now it's time for uh, the second half, the crazy cousin of the lecture. However, when collinearity exists, it causes instability, as I've already said, that instability makes our regression coefficient estimates unreliable. That same instability can make the R-squared estimates, and hence the VIF estimates, which are based off these R-squareds, unreliable. Which means, oh dear, it means that collinearity can kind of hide itself. That is, we might have um, artificially low or misleadingly low VIFs even in the presence of collinearity. Just because of that kind of like um, that instability, right? There's a lot of variation, a lot of kind of kind of um, um, dispersion or spread, and maybe we just happen to get the values in our model that give us a low VIF. Which means what? It means that we like to have like a secondary backup check. The secondary backup check is where things get kind of technical. And so the secondary backup check is where I'm going to do some hand waving. It's referred to as eigen analysis. Eigen analysis, I say somewhat, I would say actually probably a very technical approach. It uses things called eigenvalues and eigenvectors which if you've taken a linear algebra class, you may or may not remember, but they're technically, right, these mathematical terms from linear algebra, along with these correlation matrices. If you do want more details, we occasionally offer an elective class called multivariate analysis. It actually goes really deep into kind of how these matrices work, these eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Um, Professor Crossett may or may not go into it in some of his data mining classes, um, and or Professor uh, Ping. So to do the eigen analysis, um, we use the following code. We do uh, colon no int. Um, so again, just take my word for it. That's what you're going to type in, right? The colon is just saying it as a check for collinearity. Um, no int is you're kind of doing it not using the, the y-intercept, which is the generally recommended way of doing it. And so there's our output. Um, for the record, you could actually do that no colon um, or colon no int and VIF at the same time. Um, I've kind of split them up so I could talk about them separately. But in practice, you would probably just put them both in there and kind of look at everything all at once. Um, one snapshot instead of two. Now, the, that colon statement gives us that, that stuff on the bottom. We're going to really focus initially on that condition index. You see that condition index? 
notice that those numbers are getting larger and larger. All right, it goes from 1 to 3 to uh, 4.9 to 6.9. That's what we're going to focus on. Um, let's go to the next slide and kind of see in what way we're going to focus on it. So the approach is this. We look at that condition index column. The numbers in this column will always be increasing. We are only going to consider the largest number, which is conveniently located at the bottom, will be the last number. This, this, this last number is called the condition number. If it's more than 30, then that's evidence of collinearity. Notice our last number is 6.9. That is not more than 30. So our secondary test confirms that we do not have a problem with collinearity, that we're good. Conclusion. Our condition number is 6.88, which is less than 30. So as I said, there's no issues with collinearity. Huzzah! But, 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 what if, what if there had been collinearity? Well, that means that there's a problem with some of our x variables, right? Some of our x variables are heavily related to one another. The first question is, which are the x variables that are related to one another, right? What are our problem variables? The typical approach for finding the problem variables is to look at the last row and look for any variables whose proportion of variance is more than 0 0.5. So I think, I hope that I, I have the output on the next slide. I'm crossing my fingers. Let's see. Yeah. So again, right, this is like a big what if, because realistically in this situation, we don't have a problem, so we shouldn't be doing this. But imagine that that last number was more than 30. What would we do? We would go to the right. Right, we see we have this proportion of variance. There's numbers for every one of our x variables. We would look at our x variables and find the ones that have values um, more than 0.5. And in this case, it looks like those variables are what? Chest girth and neck girth. That makes sense, doesn't it? They're actually both kind of these like anatomical circumferences. So it's kind of saying that like what that there's a lot of correlation between chest and neck, that the two of them are are heavily correlated. At least that's what it would be saying if that number was more than 30. Again, in this case, it's not. But I'm just saying imagine it's 30 so we can get a sense of kind of what we would do next. We would find the variables that have um, a proportion of variance more than 0 0.50. In this case, that's chest and neck. And we would get rid of one of them. I think I talk more about this idea of getting rid of it on the next slide. Let's see. Yeah. So then what? So we have chest girth and neck girth. We should remove one of those variables. It feels like a little bit sad to kick out a variable that was originally significant. But in theory, it shouldn't be that big a deal, right? It shouldn't be that big a deal. Why? Because the whole idea of this collinearity is that the variables are redundant. They're functions of one another. One of them is extraneous. Getting rid of it, well, is not a big deal because it's replicated by the other variable. Now, which variable do we get rid of? Chest girth or neck girth? Well, the one we get rid of should be picked based on practical in scientific considerations, which is difficult to simulate in a classroom, and not p-values. Why not p-values? Because we just determined that there's collinearity. Collinearity sort of makes everything unreliable. So we can't really rely on the truthfulness of our p-values. So because of that, right, we would talk to like a subject specialist and say, okay, of these variables, which one's the most important, which one's the least important, which one do you think we can get rid of? Maybe if they're equally important, maybe one of them is easier to record than the other. Right? That's what I mean by practical considerations. But we let those drive our decision, typically, rather than the p-values. One sort of special situation is polynomial models. Um, 
often we collinearity can be a big issue when you have um, polynomial terms like age and age squared or interaction terms right we, we might imagine I mean it makes sense to us that age and age squared right might be heavily correlated right when age is large age squared is large when age is small age squared is relatively small so we would expect a high correlation between those two things in this case right I mean if we have a model that generally has curvature getting rid of either one of those variables is sort of less than satisfying so we need an alternative solution and we'll talk about that alternative solution actually in next week's lecture next week um, we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk more explicitly about polynomials and we'll talk about the problem of collinearity and, and kind of a special unique way of fixing that in polynomials so that's kind of a special situation we'll talk about more down the road and then here we are so again in class this will have been a four-hour lecture um, which means that there is no time for um, a lab however um, there is this really 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 great web page or website or example and that's the link and that's going to be like our surrogate lab so take a breather take a break but then go to that page and you'll see it has this really nice example all with SAS code and all with SAS output, where it essentially walks us through the whole process that we just talked about. Talks about outliers, diagnostics, residual plots, collinearity. It brings it all together in one nice collected example to help reinforce right, what we've already talked through. Of course, in addition to that, there's our textbook. Our textbook has some some underlying running examples that also tie it all together and there will be some practice problems and homework problems as well for us to further practice on and eventually get some feedback on all right you've done it you've got to the top of Mount Everest I don't know that the material is quite as challenging as the partial F test but there's definitely more of it this is easily the longest lecture out of out of all the lectures in this class and so that's now behind us so uh so it's all easy peasy from here on out enjoy